Alrighty, it is four o'clock and I see all of our board members are present. So we will go ahead and get started to respect your time. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon and good to see everyone's smiling faces. Thank you for making time on a Thursday afternoon for a special board meeting. We want to welcome all of our board, our staff, our families and any community members that are also watching today. So thank you so much. And again, shout out to Bridget and Leslie for making sure everything's put together and in order for our special board meeting. And I uh, want to say hello to Dr. Miguel as well. Uh, and uh, I think this is your first official special board meeting, right, Dr. Miguel? So yes, um, but I but I realize you guys do this often, so I'm going to get you. Through. <laughs> we just really love each other and want to see each other. So all right, well, I'll go ahead and call this. Yeah, that's right. We'll call this meeting to order if, um, and I'll, I'll read our board norms and protocols at every board meeting. Um, so as a board, we agree to differences of opinions in making decisions for the district to follow best practices in managing the superintendent and the management of the board itself to stay on task when conducting business for the district, including while at board meetings to never surprise the superintendent or each other when conducting official business of the district to read these norms at the beginning of each board meeting and at board workshops as a reminder of how to conduct our meetings and to continually self-check to determine if we are following our norms when conducting district business. Um, so with that, Bridget, would you please do a roll call for us? Leslie is handling this meeting. She is awesome. Okay. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark present. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew present. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys present. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez present. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page present. Dr. Wynn. Aldenia Wynn present. And Dr. Yeager. Stacy present. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, before we get to the, the approval of the agenda, I just want to give a shout out again to all our staff. I know we are um, on the brink of starting and opening up school next week. And there's been a lot of great work being done by all of our staff and teachers and family advocacy days this week. And so just want to give a shout out to everybody. Um, we know we're in unprecedented times and, and uh, this school year is going to be one to remember, but we will, as I've said before, and as the board has said previously, we will get through this together um, and we will have an excellent school year. And it's because of all of you and you will make it a special, a special and amazing school year for all of our students. So we'll have a hiccup or two and that's okay, uh, but we'll get through it. So thank you as we pre prepare to start remote learning next week. I just wanted to give a shout out on behalf of the board to all of our staff that are working so hard. So thank you. Um, so we will now have the approval of our special agenda. Um, I would actually request to add an agenda item today um, to appoint our deputy uh, clerk um, so I would request a, or ask for a motion to add that to the agenda today. So moved. Second. Greg, Greg, is there something special we have to do for this with it being a special meeting? It is, and I just want to make sure the motion reads correctly because it, it's affecting, it's going to effectuate what Randy is suggesting. But technically what you're doing is that you can't, amend the agenda for a special meeting it has to be for the purpose of notice what you're really doing is you're you're doing a second special meeting for the purpose of appointing the deputy clerk it has to be a unanimous vote because you don't have the notice time under the statute so that's technically what the motion would read and uh leslie i can help you draft the motion for the minute so it reads correctly in there but i want everybody to understand what you're really doing is you're doing a second special meeting for the sole purpose of appointing the deputy clerk and you're waiving notice of that special meeting requirement. Thank you, Greg. So that's been moved and seconded um, with what Greg said. <laughs> Any further discussion or questions? Okay, Leslie, would you please do a roll call vote, please? You no. muted. There you go. Okay, hold on just a second. And it, it, it may not give you the option for that, so you'll have to do it by hand and we'll add it later. Do you want me okay. to do, do you want me to do that really quickly? 
Okay. Yes. Okay. Please. Uh, Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Uh, Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Nadine Nguyen. Nadine Nguyen, yes. Stacey Aker. Stacey, yes. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. So the motion has passed. So thank you, everybody, for that. Thank you, Leslie and Greg. So um, we will continue continue on. Do, Greg, do we need to approve the, the special agenda for today, or is that kind of an effect? What, what, I, what I would suggest is you go ahead and take the deputy clerk issue up now, um, get that done, and then move on to approve the regular agenda, um, and then move forward with the um, uh, discussion of the uh, policy changes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will, um, so we would like to um, take up appointment of our deputy clerk, um, Jamia Warren at this time. So I would entertain a motion to do so. So move. Second. Okay. Been moved and seconded. Um, any discuss further discussion or questions? Okay. Leslie, please do a roll call vote or Bridget. You want me to hop in? I'll hop in. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Valdini Wynn. Valdini Wynn, yes. Stacey Yaker. Stacey, yes. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, everybody. Sorry to throw you a curveball, Leslie and Bridget, for your first <laughs> meeting that you're taking on. It's uh, a good to learn. That's right. That's how we do it around here. So thank, thanks for your patience, y'all. Okay, so now I would entertain a motion to approve the special agenda. So move. Second. Moved and second. Further discussion? Okay. Leslie, would you please do a roll call? Yolanda Clark. Wanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Yeager. Dr. Yeager, yes, thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. So we have approved the agenda for today. So we will jump right into board discussion with uh, reviewing policies today. So the first one up, we have um, policy AC. Greg, I'll just kick it over to you. Um, so board policy AC, uh, which this is one of the two that the board uh, tentatively adopted in um, uh, the end of July or 1st of August, I can't remember what the date of the meeting was, and that was to comply with the changes for Title IX. So this board policy is a new policy. Um, it is meant to encapsulate a prohibition on discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. Uh, the reason we suggested that there be a policy um, AC that's separate and is a standalone is similar to what several other districts are doing. This is a departure from what KASB is doing. Uh, one of the things that, that in looking at this that we were concerned about is that um, your discrimination policies are scattered in different places within your board policy. So you have one policy for race discrimination, one policy for race harassment, one policy for sex discrimination, one policy for sex harassment, and then a generic non-discrimination uh, prohibition for uh, things like um, uh, religion and um, national origin and age and disability and genetic information. So we thought for consistency's sake that there really ought to be a single policy adopted by the board and it ought to be housed in the section A, which is the umbrella piece of your policy rather than being buried in the policies on students and the policies on personnel that globally prohibits discrimination of all types in all programs for the district. And this is similar to what Shawnee Mission has done. It's similar to what um, Spring Hill has done and several other districts as well. Um, and the reason for that is so that you don't 
so that when you get complaints that come in or if you get somebody that's 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 has an issue with discrimination or harassment or retaliation it's crystal clear that it's it's prohibited by the board as a board policy regardless of the basis for what the discrimination is and regardless of whether it's in a program whether it's in employment whether it's in access to facilities it doesn't matter uh, it's prohibited by the board and so that's what the intent or purpose of this is um, one of the things we talked about that this is still up for a second read and we were trying to get this done before the title IX thing. Um, uh, it's labeled as policy AC. One of the corrections that I'm going to suggest you make as a modification is we have a different policy AC that we did not catch that deals with, uh, what is it deal with, with grade levels for um, students within the district. So we would suggest re renumbering this, not AC, to make it AH, which is a blank one. You don't have an AH. So that is a modification we would suggest. But even though it was uh, adopted to be in place to comply with the statutory changes to Title IX, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in connection with K KN, uh, any changes or any suggested changes that the board has or questions the board has about AC uh, I'm happy to take up and to uh, uh, put, put pen to paper and, and bring those back for a third read or further modification by the board. Mr. Gohan, when you say we, who are you speaking of? Uh, uh, the district as a whole, as I, I think I was referring to. No, you say we decided this and we decided that. Who, who, who is we? I, I'm making the recommendation, so I guess I'm, if I'm saying we, I'm saying my firm, I did. I, I didn't mean we. Okay. It wasn't like a group of people that got together. Um, it was in looking at the policy, looking at how KASB was making the cha suggested changes. My concern was I don't want there to be, I don't want different forms of discrimination to be treated differently by different departments in your uh, district. And I didn't want there to be any gap or confusion about, you know, somebody quibbling or quarreling that, okay, you prohibit discrimination language differently in your student section as it is in your employment section as it is in your program section or your or any other spot in the district policy. So I wanted at least one firm statement somewhere that just said no matter where it's at, no matter what type we're talking about, it is prohibited by the board. And you, and we nor, you normally suggest that we follow KASB. Why are they not going down this path? So the reason that they're not going down this path is because the regulations that have been brought into place by Title IX, the, the new Title IX regulations, are specific to Title IX, which is sex discrimination, and. It, within KN, and this is why we, we are differing from our advice to what KSB's advice is on KN as well. What KSB is, is doing is because those investigation requirements are more rigorous and more robust for Title IX, um, you have more requirements for a sex discrimination complaint investigation than you do for other types of discrimination. It's my opinion and my advice to the district that you should not treat your investigation process differently simply because it's a sex discrimination complaint as opposed to a race or, or ethnicity or religion complaint. I think that it would confuse your personnel. I think they would make mistakes in the investigation. And I think that you should have one process that applies regardless of the type of discrimination. Uh, KSB has taken a different approach. They've done that because they've got a lot of districts that they deal with um, that maybe um, don't uh, want to be held to a higher investigation standard for complaints than they're required to by statute or regulation. So to me, if you've got the Department of Education through regulation setting Title IX investigation standards here, I don't think you should have separate standards for race or religion or age discrimination uh, in your investigation process. And so that's why I am recommending that it be a single policy rather than broken down policies. You'll still have your standalone 
prohibitions in um, your personnel section and in your student section prohibiting the different types of discrimination. But I think you should have one flow through. In other words, if I come to you and complain, and I'm complaining about discrimination or harassment, I think your administration should investigate that the same way, regardless of what type of discrimination complaint it is. Okay, so moving forward, are you going to share your screen so that we can look at the, you can point out the specific places where? I don't know how to do that. Randy, can you oh, put can. Because I think, I think Randy can do it for us. But yes, I think that's a good idea. So, so Greg, essentially you're saying instead of having the Title IX being higher requirements than the other ones, you want all of our requirements to be up here on correct. the Title IX level. So we're, ra we're raising our standards across the board instead of having lower standards for some investigations. That's right. Okay. I, think, I think you should have one process, one procedure for all discrimination, harassment, or retaliation complaints. Um, you're still going to have a couple of different types of investigations that are not discrimination oriented. But to me, I... You know, you've got a Title IX coordinator, a Title VI coordinator, the same person. Statutes read almost the same. I don't know why you'd have different types of investigations for those two types of complaints. I think it would be confusing. I think your your personnel would make mistakes in doing the investigation process. You know, I just I think it's better to have a certain type of investigation, regardless of the nature of the complaint. So that will that require rewriting the protocol for all for distribution to all employees yeah so yes so your time so kn is then the investigation process and that's the one where we've made most of the changes in this um but that's that's the mechanism so right now the investigators that you guys have that are internal that are get, have gotten the title nine training and there's been a lot of time spent on that this year um they would then have the same investigation process for any other type of complaint that would come forward you would have one way in which that happens as opposed to having three or four different ways and i think that would be a better process it would be more effective for your district than having multiple types of ways of investigation. Right. I understand that you made that clear. My question was, is this going to be protocol distributed in print to all employees? So everyone knows the process. I think it should be. I mean, certainly it's going to be available online, but I, I don't see why you shouldn't roll it out to everybody and say, this is what the process is. It's, I mean, it's, it's important for everybody to understand what that process is. We've run into that in a couple of complaints that have come forward in the past as part of the rollout and training that goes on this fall. I think they should all be given a copy of it. Okay. And th that copy would be in what format? Is it in certain manuals or contract or what format? So it, it's it's going to be on your board policy. So it'd be there located there, but I think you could email it out to everybody or if you wanted to put it, I don't know if you guys have a handbook for personnel. I know you have a student handbook um, and the student handbook will refer to the board policy to, to KN, although it won't reprint KN. Um, but I don't know why this couldn't go out with either a link to it or a um, hard copy to, to all your employees and all your students or parents. And, and to I, have I, that, I it, does that take a motion or is that just clear understanding? I I don't know that it requires a motion. If, okay. if that's a motion from the board, then that's that should take place. But I assume that Dr. Miguel's got no issue with having that sent out to everybody. Um, okay. And Thank I you. was going to add in the past, what we have done is with certain policies that were identified, we would have them on the professional, uh, on, on the calendar for principals to train, to communicate the policies with staff. So the way I see it is this would be one more of those policies that we put it on that calendar. What, what I would suggest, what I would suggest is you have your title nine, title six, um, coordinator actually do training for both students and for faculty in the district on, uh, this, the new C, which will be AH and the change to KN so that they have an updated understanding of 
what the process is, where they complain that they've got discrimination, how that all works. I think that would be an excellent thing to do. Perfect. We can do that. Do they need to sign off to say that they've been trained so they you should. wouldn't have anybody say, I didn't know, they couldn't plead ignorance, that you signed, you yeah. were trained on this day. It just makes sense considering some of the things that we're going through. I would so agree for, with. A, for any of these trainings we of policy on policies, we always have, and even for the title trainings, we always have a signing sheet. And now we moved all of that um, into frontline, so they have to register and they have to sign in. Okay. And one of, one, of the, one of the things, Ms. Page, that's in there. I don't know if you saw this within AC. There's a train. There's a specific training section. It's on. Randy, is there any way you could put AC up there? I think it's a good idea for the board to, to make sure we, we talk about the different sections here and not, not rush through this entirely. But can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. If you scroll down to the second page, there's a section there. You see it where it talks about training. Mm -hmm. It says the board will provide annual training. So this is the first time you guys are requiring this as a board. This hasn't been technically required in the past. The board, the district will provide annual training to employees on identifying and reporting acts that may constitute discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. The compliance coordinator, and that's your Title IX, Title VI designated coordinator. I think it's Lisa Walker. Um, designated investigators designated decision makers and designated appeal officers and all those are part of the process now um they'll facilitate uh, will receive additional annual training above and beyond what your general staff received to make sure they understand how to implement the process and also have a duty to that the, the board when you adopt this you're requiring that to be done on an annual basis for all your employees so that's new um and i think that's an important piece um, and then the second one is that you're going to provide that same instruction to students regarding discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. I left that as, as appropriate, but if the board wanted that to be annual and wanted to mandate it, that's a place where you guys could make a modification to this that you might want. You might want students to get that every single year. And if that's the case, then this is the place to change that. Well, okay. it, to me, it would make sense to make that annual for everybody in lieu of what we just went through. I've got I've got zero problem with making that change if that's what the board wants. I just wanted to have some flexibility in it. So if you want that annual to the students, then I will make that change. So and I'm while it doesn't need to be written that is at the beginning of each academic year, it would not make any sense to have it any later. Right. Right. It would not. It, I mean, you know, the only the only reason you make it as annual is if you have somebody who comes into employment after the start of the year, they'd still be required to get the training. Correct. Right. So, so in anticipation yeah. of this, Dr. Miguel, is it is there um, a professional development day early? to include this? So we always have, um, before the beginning of school, the days for principals and the, and the week before school starts for teachers. This could easily be part of that training. Uh, we just, for example, we just finished doing the mandatory training for all of um, the trainings that are mandated by the state and the federal government. So this would be one more of those. And okay, then we have- all employees. Yeah, and the way and the way we have those um, mandated trainings now, HR has a process that for any new employee, the Wednesday following uh, board meeting, they get all the mandatory trainings. So there is already a process in place, and I think we would just include this one too. And there is sexual harassment training that's part of that too, mm -hmm. that's right. been updated to to fall in line with the new Title IX regulations. Right. But, but this would, staff this, member. Yeah, this would get added to that and be specific mm -hmm. to discrimination. And that's also Correct. one of the 
reason why I didn't want to break it out and only be a sex discrimination. To me, it's important that it's all forms of discrimination. So Dr. Wynn, you'll notice that the next thing immediately after the training and Randy, can you scroll down just a little bit so the public notice shows up? So you're also, this is what the board is now requiring how this is supposed to be published or distributed out. So this notice of non-discrimination um, will be included on the district's website and staff handbooks and student handbooks. And that's the notice section, but um, if you want different publication requirements for the policy itself, or for the complaint procedure, this would be a place to amend if the board wants to direct crystal clear. Well, where is that? Where is the procedure? Is it <laughs> earlier in the language? No, this is this is what the language is right now, making it clear what the notice of discrimination, where that has to be. But if you want to make it, if you want to make the, this policy itself or um, the complaint process, which is KN, if you want that, if you, if the board wants to require that to be in specific places, as opposed to leaving it to administration to decide, this would be the place to put that requirement in. And I certainly would be willing to do that. I think posting it every place is, is the safe, safest way. Although we don't have the language that you're talking about inserting. So, so the last we... language would be, so the board will continuously pu publish notice of this policy. You see that including information on how to report discrimination. That's policy KN. Um, and then the notice of discrimination, which is a different thing you approve every year. You approve that in your reorganization meeting. That's the one that you update with contact information each year appears on the website. But if you want this policy, and the complaint process, which is policy KN, to be published on the website, I can just add that sentence and say the notice of non-discrimination together with this policy and policy KN will be will appear on the district's website and staff handbooks, um, student handbooks, et cetera. If well, it makes want. sense to me, but you have six other people, so. What, what do the other board members think about that change and also uh, Ms. Page's suggestion on making the student training annual. Yes, that's fine by me. Yeah, you're good at it. I mean, it sounds like we got consensus on that. Is there anybody that is oppositional to those changes? Okay, we'll make those we'll make those changes to it when it comes back for the third read for everybody. And I, I have a question. The yeah. staff handbook, is it online or is it a document that they have in their hand? I'm old, so I'm just asking. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh -huh. I know that in the old days, it used to be printed out and given to everybody. I suspect it's online at this point, but I don't know that for sure. This year, it's online. Every year, we give one to each student, and they um, take it home, and they sign a page and bring the page back, um, stating they have reviewed it. With their parents but this year we are going um, to have it online and we will have parents still sign saying that they have reviewed it with the students and is it online for the staff as well that was my question in regard oh. to the staff mm. is it online or is it a document that you can have on your person I'm not, there is no staff handbook. There's policies and then there's administrators guides um, for administrators. I, so. I believe there's actually one on talent ed. There's a, okay, sorry, Matt, thank you. We read and we have to sign off on. Oh, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's in there. I can double check while we're on here. You're right. I'm yeah, sorry. We get that. an email if we don't sign it, <laughs> if we don't review it. <laughs> So Matt, this if you, is, a, if you this could is get... a side note, um, Greg, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. At the community college, the um, one has to take, watch the video, and take a test. Yep. And you must score eighty percent. You get three tries, but <laughs> no one ever fails. But that that is built-in accountability. Um, is there any 
<clears throat> I don't know what the cost of that mm -hmm. program is. Any so of our mandatory any? trainings do have those tests that follow each one mm -hmm. that require um, an 80% or more. Yeah, we do that too. So, so this is uh, manage this electric online testing and they have to perform. Okay, thank you. And I believe that's developed in house. And so one, something very similar to that could be developed for this policy and the procedure so that you could do sort of that testing to make sure they read through it and understood it. Um, I think one of the things that, that would be smart to do um, in an upcoming board meeting is to have um, somebody come and give, uh, probably Lisa Walker would be my guest, uh, come and give a, um, give the board an example of what the training looks like. And, and frankly, I think it would be wise mm -hmm. or go through the training so you guys see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be a smart thing. I think, I know, that, for example, the, the community college, the board does go through the sex harassment training and the reporting training just like the uh, other employees do. And I, I don't think that would hurt anything for this board to go through that as well. Because then you guys would see if you, if you see things in the training that you think are gaps, it would give you a chance to point those out. It would also give you guys the chance to understand what that training process looks like. And it's not a short little five question quiz. Nope, it's not. So any other questions on AC which will get renamed AH? Okay, so uh, we will make the changes to that and we will bring it back to the board for a third final read for adoption of modifications or further changes if the board decides they want further changes at, at some future point on that. So do we have to approve the second read, right? Yes. No. Yes. yes. I make a motion that we approve the second read of, is it A H? It, it will be A H. A H. <laughs> I second it. Moved and second. Any further thoughts or discussion? Okay, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Leslie, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Yeager. Casey, yes. Thank you so much. Motion passes. Thank you for the good discussion, everybody. So we'll go on to um, agenda item B for policy KN, and I'll bring up, Greg, you want the red line version brought up? Yeah, let's bring the red line version up. I think that, that's the one that makes the most sense to bring up. Um, okay. And it, that way we can walk through it and you guys can see what we did in terms of changing it. Thank you, Randy, appreciate it. You guys see the screen? Okay, so just to, in, in the sense of background, all of your policies historically, and this again is, this is how KSB has got these set up. Um, the majority of your policies flow to KN investigations of complaints. Now KN is not limited to complaints of discrimination, harassment, retaliation. Um, you've got other types of complaints that will show up within the KN policy and they all flow through from different policy places. So for example, your bullying policy flows to KN, your um, grievance policy does not. Um, so that's separate from KN. Um, ESI is slightly separate, but all of your other complaints eventually flow through the KN. The changes that KASB suggested um, to this were to, to pull the sex harassment out and have the sex harassment be a standalone complaint process that was different from your other discrimination processes. And as I talked about, I don't think that's what you should do. So what we have done is we've gone through, gone through here and, and modified the KASB recommendations consistent with the changes to Title IX, which is sex discrimination, 
but we've had those apply to all forms of complaints or discrimination. So you only have one process for your discrimination complaints. Um, and you can see sort of the initial part of this is we've, we've added in some language, um, not just for study and possible resolution, but also for investigation in the first line. And then you've got this section where we say uh, complaints involving discrimination, harassment, or retaliation um, without regard to what type it is. And then we go through and have a definitional section of the different types of uh, discrimination, harassment, Sex harassment is a little bit different, again, because you've got the regulatory requirements. So we've added that change in there. Um, and reporting responsibility comes in after that. And I know this is detailed and there's a lot of stuff in here, but all these, all this stuff is coming from the new Title IX regulations, which have made this a very much more robust policy or process than it was prior to that time, which was required by the statutes. Mm -hmm. Um, it has uh, reporting responsibility. That's a big one. So one of the issues, as you guys are aware, that we run into is, well, who's responsible for reporting harassment when it's been brought to their attention or discrimination when it's brought to their attention? Well, the answer to that is all district employees are responsible for that. So we're making that clear in your policy because your policy didn't say that before. So all district employees are responsible for preventing and responding to discrimination. Now, that responsibility differs depending on the level of the employee. If I'm, if I'm the janitor, my responsibility might be to simply report it on to the administration. But I've still got an obligation to do something. I can't just hear about discrimination that's going on and do nothing about it. I can't, do, I can't hear about retaliation. I can't witness it and not do something. Mm -hmm. The policy now says everybody's responsible for this. And if you see it, you hear about it, whatever it is, you have to take appropriate action, which is at a minimum is contacting and reporting that to your immediate supervisor so that it can get to an administrative level so that somebody can start looking into what's going on and try to put a stop to it if, if they learn about it. So um, it also talks about the compliance coordinator. Again, that's your title nine, title six coordinator. Uh, that's how that person's designated. The reason we, we have that in here is because that person's not tied to a specific building or facility. That's sort of this double piece. You recall we've added the electronic, um, I'll call it a button or link on every website for every school in the district and on the district's general website. And if you go in and you report something there, one report goes to administrator at the building, one report goes to the Title IX compliance officer so that you don't have um, one person getting it and if they drop the ball, nobody knows that it happened. So you've got two places where that's going, one at the district level and one at the building level um, so that you've got this checks and balance to make sure nothing falls between the cracks. Um, now that's not in the policy, but that is procedurally what the policy is, is saying has to happen. Um, and, and you've got reporting obligations that, that fall within, within that process. Um, you'll see references to other policies. So for example, you've got mandatory reporting obligations. You'll see there that GAAD, that's the requirement that you have to report child abuse or neglect that applies to all employees of the district. And so if you get a complaint in that's sex harassment in this case, or any other type of harassment, or, that would also constitute abuse that has to go to DCF. And so we're reminding people in this policy, if they're going through this process that, okay, yeah, I don't want to forget about that obligation that I've got as well. Um, if you look at the, Randy, could you scroll down just a little bit for me, just past the indented paragraphs, the one that says district employees makes it very clear. Uh, go back up. It, it's blocked off on my screen. There you go. Um, you see where it says district employees who fail to meet these reporting requirements will be subject to discipline up to and including termination, but in no event will a victim be disciplined for failing to make a report. So we're making it very clear in here that if you fail to report discrimination, harassment, um, or retaliation, that you can be subject to discipline for failing to do the report. 
That doesn't mean we couldn't discipline somebody right now, but this makes it very clear to those individuals that, that you have that obligation. And if you fail to do that, we can discipline you as an employee. But we also make it clear at the same time that if you got a victim who maybe is afraid to make a report, that we're not going to discipline that individual. So that's the, that's the nuance there, uh, if that makes sense. Well, what if the victim lied? I, I don't mean any harm. In the car situation, where someone didn't tell the truth. Yeah. So are we just letting them off the hook because you're you not somebody else's life in jeopardy. So is that written somewhere? I believe. They, yeah, I believe that's in here, Wanda, and I will double check to make sure. But that is a good point, and it it is. Um, I think the language. I have to. I'll have to find it, but I believe there's language in here that says that if you if you you're protected as long as you're reporting something in good faith. If you if you falsify a report or if you report something in bad faith, then you would be subject to discipline just like anybody else who made something up. So if I if I falsified a report, if I came forward and I lied about what somebody allegedly did to me to get them in trouble, um, I'd be subject to discipline for that as well. But I will I will find that language and point it out to you and if for some reason I don't see it in there, I will make sure that is in there and probably in the same location, okay? Thank you. So where it says insert contact info, this is Lisa Walker or whomever the compliance coordinator is? Correct, correct. And and the, the reason it says insert contact info and link is because when we presented this, you guys hadn't made the formal appointment yet for this year. So each year that, that language will change depending on the person who's identified. Okay, and it won't be hidden in this type of language. I mean, it, this policy will be posted and it, be, it will be clear the person's name yes. and, and info. Because if, if, if someone has to look for the, the, the person's name, it's useless. Right. I, I completely agree. So th what, what will happen here is in this document, once it's adopted, you will put the current contact information, which will be the name, the address, at, which will be the central office address, because that's where she's located, the email address, the phone number, and a, and a link, again, to your um, reporting, where somebody can report anonymously or however uh, as well. That will all be here and then that will get updated each year. Separate from being in this policy, however, that same contact information is in your notice of non-discrimination, which is posted on the website for each, um, for the district. Um, and that's a much smaller uh, document. Um, and I believe that contact information is also included in your student handbook as well. Um, and is it posted? in each building. I saw reference earlier that the policy is posted in each building. It, it, it is supposed to be posted in each building. Is there a designated location? Since I think, the, yeah, I, I don't, not by, not by policy, but that would, that would be something that would be determined as appropriate for each building or each facility, but uh, that should be, there should be a designated location just like any of your other. Uh, right. You know, stuff that would have to be reposted whether that's in you know if you're over in facilities or grounds it's probably there's probably a workplace board where that would go if it's in the um i don't know if it'd be in the office for your um office probably makes sense or if you have like a teacher's lounge or something that would be the other place it would make sense well as long as it's not hidden i yeah. we're not saying deliberately hidden but you know i don't have to run to the elevator to, to find it <laughs> Or the there's, there's no elevator or the boiler or the boiler room where you're trying to yeah you know, right no absolutely and it should be there should be a link to it or a posting of it on each each school's website as well and i think i've seen them posted by the gymnasiums too in the yeah. hallways and by the restrooms but i think that's a great question and we can probably get the administration to let you guys know where they're posted within each building i mean it, that should be pretty uniform you should be able to know I walk into John F. Kennedy, I can go find it if I want to go look for it. I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to dig to find it. 
I do like the, the fact of them all being uniform. I think that's really important. I agree. Um, I don't think that's a policy piece, but I think that's something that you, your expectation should be there for. And I think administration should be able to come back and give you a report on this is where they're at everywhere. So. Well, you saying it shouldn't be, a, you sure we shouldn't make it a, of late? It seems like we don't say it. It doesn't come out that way and everybody misunderstands. So why shouldn't that be a policy piece to say that it should be posted at, and then that way there's no ifs, no buts, it's there. And nobody can say, well, you didn't tell us where to put it. Um, what I think it should say, if it doesn't say, and I've jotted a note down for myself that it should be posted everywhere, but I think you guys did that essentially in A. What I don't know is whether you guys should say it has to be at this location in each building, because I don't know if each location, in each building would be the same in terms of access. Um, so I, my only hesitation, and it's not much of a hesitation, because I agree with you, it, the, the board, this should be a mandated piece. This shouldn't be something that is discretionary with, with a building principal to decide, well, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put this one in the, you know, the, the hallway that leads out through the, the, the back access pathway to the parking lot. Um, but I don't know if each office is, e is easily accessible to all your teachers. You kind of want it somewhere where the majority of your staff are going to be able to see it. So not knowing enough about each individual building, I don't know if it would automatically be the same location in each building or not. Um, I understand what you're saying. But mm -hmm. of late, when we just leave it, well, you said it where you weren't clear, you weren't precise. That game is getting old. So it needs to be precise. If we have to give six or seven places as an option and at least two out of three, if at least possible, to say where it should be posted, I, I, you know, I'm just scared to leave it to chance. Uh, can can we just make a proposal to to tell you where they're located because i think we could tell you where most of them are located at in most buildings what what if, what, if, what if we did this because i agree with um, miss page on this what if we um each I would say each year or whatever that the the administration will notify the board where this policy is located mm -hmm. in each building mm -hmm. And if we wanted to be specific, we could say a place accessible to all employees, such as teacher's work room, teacher's break room, mm -hmm. or um, break room, because that's what we would have here in this building. Mm -hmm. Elevators. So maybe we can name three or four places that we know, give some options. But I don't think we can say one place, because not every building may have a break room or an mm -hmm. elevator. Greg, aren't there aren't there some posters that uh, that are required by federal law to be posted yes. in some places? Yes. And um, can we kind of follow some of those directions to see where those posters are, are required and make sure that we at least have these posters in those spots too, mm -hmm. and and see what those locations are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And generally, you know, like in the office, the teacher's lounge, the mm -hmm. teacher's lunchroom, wherever they happen to be, those usually are the mandates where they used to put them. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know. To, there's some things that have to be by time clocks and stuff like that. Maybe they, like, like you said, they can come back and give us a report where most things are posted, like the labor law posters and stuff. And yeah, then... Gonna, go ahead, Jeannie. I'm sorry. And because you, you can't, you can overpost things and people start to ignore them. So if we, if we get things posted where everyone looks, it's better than posting them everywhere. Yeah, I, I think, I think the big key here is you want, you want it where people will look if they need it. Right? Yeah. Um, because that's, that's, you don't want people having to hunt for this stuff. Right. Exactly. And with the record that we have had thus far, 
we need to overpost. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. In my opinion. So if we have federally required posters posted in other places, we need to make sure that we cover those places too. Yeah. I, what I've, I've written down a note that we'll, we'll come back with some language to add to this. It gives uh, specifics on postings uh, in different locations. And then also, I mean, to me, from sort of the I don't know what the right term is, but sort of a assurance to the to the board that this is happening. I think we get a report that says this is where they're at everywhere, um, and then you guys know. Make sure your language says they shall be posted one, two, three, four. Yeah. Nobody can debate what the definition of shall is. Nope. I think those are good suggestions. Okay, so then the next section here deals with the complaint process and it gives some definitions. Um, these definitions, the, the real issue is they, they, they just make it clear um, what is triggered by different, different things, um, just so that people aren't confused about what the language might mean later on. Uh, one thing to look at here is what's called supportive measures. This is brand new for your policies. This is part of what's required for Title IX for sex discrimination. It's one of the reasons that I thought it was important that it apply to all forms of discrimination. Randy, can you scroll down just a little bit further, please? Sorry. See where it says supportive measures? Okay. So. For Title IX, for sex discrimination, the regulations now require if you have somebody who makes a complaint of harassment or discrimination based or retaliation based upon sex or gender, the employer of the school district is required not only to investigate the complaint of discrimination and not only to take appropriate disciplinary action against the person who is uh, perpetrating the harassment or the discrimination if it's found to be um, something that's happened, but the district is also required to provide services to support the individual who's the victim of that complaint, whether that's a student or whether that's an employee. And you're required to make sure that those are in place to make sure that the student doesn't suffer educationally, uh, doesn't lose educational opportunities, those types of things that protects them from being retaliated against, to protect them from further acts of discrimination uh, that are ongoing while the investigation's taking place and to, to maintain their safety. I thought, again, it's important to me that that would apply to all employees who are, or students who are victims of discrimination and it shouldn't matter whether it's just based upon their sex or gender, it should apply if it's race, if it's ethnicity, if it's age, um, if it's disability, uh, that, that, so this is an obligation that you're taking on by policy that you're not required to take on by statute or regulation. And that's why I'm pointing it out. But that's why I, I thought it was appropriate because to me, I don't think it matters why if you're being retaliated against or, or harassed or discriminated against and that's impacting your ability to receive educational opportunities. And I feel like the district should have that responsibility to make sure we're providing supportive services for that victim of that retaliation, discrimination, or harassment. But understand this is a policy change and it is something that you're not required to do by statute or regulation, except for in the sex discrimination context. So if the board wants to limit it to just what you're required to do by statute, you would not have to do this. So I'm, I'm pointing that out um, and maybe pause here for a second just to make sure we're all okay with that. Is there any reason why some paragraphs have no period? Yeah, so the ones that have no paragraph, or those are, those are sub paragraphs, so like this one that says range of supportive measures. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, that's, it has, a, that's it has just, a period. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's I think that's a typo. Okay. 
And, and if you see typos like that, uh, please point them out because it's hard when you're going through. I see that on a couple places now, like you're saying. Um, so we'll try to we'll try to catch those. But another set of eyes looking at stuff always helps. So if you see that, or if you see something that's the sentence is not worded correctly, um, please please let us know that that's the case so that we can try and correct it. Because a lot of times when you're reading these and making changes, you can in your mind you you read it one way and it's written a different way. So so anything you catch like that, let me know. Okay. Now, is state law um, incorporated or referenced or what about about bullying, about harassment? Yeah, so your bullying harassment policy technically has a different process. This this is geared. This section of this is geared toward um, the the discrimination, which would both be federal and state law. Um, down at the, I'm get, let me get ahead of myself here real quick to look, to see this, to make sure I got it right. Um, your bullying and harassment policy, uh, which is the state law requirement, uh, ties into KM, but it doesn't tie specifically into the discrimination, uh, retaliation and harassment provision. That is a that is something the board could do if you wanted to. So if you wanted, if it was just a bullying and harassment complaint, it didn't have a um, discrimination component to it. If you wanted that to follow the same process, it'd be real simple. We just add the language for um, bullying into there and in a reference to the statutory state side. Yeah. So is that something you guys are interested in doing? Well, let me just t give you the scenario then. then yeah we can decide would not want a person to pull up the state reference about or online someplace about bullying and mm -hmm. the process they follow and then when they come to the district the response is oh you didn't follow our policy therefore either we'll dismiss it or you must go through it again that's just a scenario that I, I would like, I would think we would want to avoid. I don't know how to mesh the two or even if there's a need to mesh, but so that if you look at bullying policy from another source, are they, are they, are they congruent? Are they cohesive? Are they, um, they, they won't they, be the same, but. They're, they're not exactly the same. It, this this process would comply with the bullying um, requirements under Kansas law. Um, y y we do have a separate reference to that in the bullying section, um, but understand uh, that bullying could potentially be race, sex, disability discrimination. And so when you're complying with the investigation process, um, in my mind, at least, again, you, you, you want to avoid anything where the investigator makes mistakes because they're, because they pigeonholed what they think the complaint is. Exactly. Right? They've they labeled it incorrectly. That's, that's exactly right. And, and I, I try really hard and we, we've tried over the last several years to try to eliminate those silos that people at the outset decide, okay, this person's complaining about sex discrimination. So that's the only thing I'm going to look at. Well, okay. that's not right. Um, so it might make some sense and it wouldn't take much for me to, to double check the bullying um, process to see if we could just meld that into this. So you have one, one way of doing it, but you know, yeah, that, it's, if the board it's, that, I think that makes six sense. other people, but seemingly one stop shop for this would could be um, an easier way to uh, provide training. Here's the document it right, what else? Is it 19 pages or something? 10 pages? 
so that I don't have to go to Appendix A or Appendix B. So it's... Well, the, the other advantage to that is if I'm the investigator, I'm not worrying about trying to label it. I'm just, this is my process. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, so you have six other comments to... So what, are the other, what do the other board members think about that? Do you want me to look to see about merging the bullying um, complaint process into the, the harassment and discrimination uh, process? I personally like when things are streamlined um, versus having several different things in several different places. So, okay. yeah. I agree with you, Linda and Dr. Wynn. Sounds good. So is there, it sounds like we got a consensus on that too. So I will, um, I will take a look at the bullying part of it, and I will um, see if we can meld the two together, and that will be part of what we'll bring back to the board to look at or consider uh, when we do the next read on this thing. Um, the the next thing, Randy, if you could scroll down to where it says complaint process overview. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here, and this is a place that uh, other districts, not just 500, are struggling with this. This is another component of the Title IX piece. Um, we did the best we could to kind of sift this out, but you do have this problem that runs into effect when you get something that has a criminal component to it and law enforcement gets involved and they want they don't want you to interfere with their investigation and that can cause delays in, in the district's investigation of the uh, harassment, um, discrimination, or whatever else it might be. We have to have a provision in there to deal with that. I just want to point it out to the board that in those situations, we're gonna, we may have to delay investigations, um, but we still have an obligation to do those investigations, even if law enforcement is um, looking at it from a criminal standpoint. So, um, I've got it in there as best I could I could do. We can't interfere with what law enforcement's doing, but we still have an obligation to prevent discrimination and harassment in our schools of whatever nature. So we do have that independent obligation. But I wanted to point it out because it is a place where sometimes it can be frustrating because we don't know what law enforcement is doing or not doing in, in regards to a particular situation. Um, and this just talks about what that, what that looks like. So, uh, this kind of runs through the complaint process. Um, and I think that this is, this is new. It, it details out what that process looks like more effectively. Scroll down just a little bit further, Randy. The part he's scrolling through is parts about the, they've got the, everybody's got the right to still complain to like EEOC, OCR, those things at the same time. Here's the complaint process steps. Ordinarily, this would be a procedure and it wouldn't be part of board policy, but Title IX is requiring it that you have a detailed process. And uh, again, I think this is important enough that I think that you want a board directive of this is what the board's expectations are as opposed to leaving it to a procedure. So this is the um, process that's required. Um, you've got some differentiation in here with Title IX where there are some specific requirements to Title IX that are a little bit different, but they're not uh, significant in terms of the departure. And sorry, my neighbor's mowing, so if you hear a mower going, it'll, I apologize. Um, so if you see 3A, there's some additional formal steps required for Title nine those protections are really for um some of the uh summarization requirements um and review of the evidence pieces of it but that's the only difference that we've carved out for the title nine exception otherwise everything falls through um, the same way for each of the types of discrimination that could be in play there's an appeal process that's specifically laid out um, for the determination. And then the next part deals with confidentiality and retention of records and information. Again, a requirement of Title IX, but I think important to all types of 
of, of potential complaints or processes that might come into play. And then after that is just the, the markouts that, of the old process that we took out. Um, I believe that the KSB recommendations were posted. If they're not posted, I will provide those to you. But I, I think that the, the outline that we've come up with for this blends the Title IX requirements into requirements for all forms of discrimination. It covers what KSB does. I think it's a cleaner way to do this. Uh, I understand why they're doing a different um, path, but I, I think this is a better fit for for this district and frankly, for all the districts that I work with, I'm, I'm recommending that this is a process that they go with. So uh, at the end of this, you'll see if you scroll down to some of the, the leftover stuff, this is still in your, this is in your, your current policy. There are other types of complaints that don't fit discrimination. So if you've got a, a complaint about policy, somebody from the community says, hey, I don't like your policy on how you pay for student lunches. Well, that doesn't require, that's a complaint, but that's not a complaint that requires this big formal investigation. That's one that, that um, the superintendent can deal with. And that's, this is old KSB policy language. Same things with complaints about curriculum. Somebody wants to complain about the curriculum. That's not really the proper mechanism to go through a big, big formal uh, investigation. That's, that really goes a different direction. That would go over to your curriculum department to take a look at what the concerns are and bring those back to the board to figure out whether that's how you want to move forward or not. Same thing, structural materials. So that those are those are holdovers. Um, the one that, that says complaints about personnel is a little bit odd, but that what that's talking about is that's talking about your grievance processes, um, which are governed by your negotiated agreement for um, teachers and by um, the handbook process for your classified employees. So that's that's what that's addressing. Um, and then the emergency safety interventions, that's a completely separate policy and process. This is one of those that has a state law requirement. So that's governed by a separate policy that wouldn't fit within the umbrella of the discrimination or harassment uh, situation unless um, the allegation was that the, the emergency safety, safety interventions were being done inequitably based upon gender or disability or some other factor, in which case this policy would get triggered. Mr. So, Goyen, I have a question about complaints about personnel. Yeah. Um, if a complaint is made to let's say to the building principal mm -hmm. about a personnel. Now that, does that mean parent, public, uh, staff, is, does that, is that where that falls? Yeah, I, I, like I said, this is a holdover from the, K, the current KSB policy and they left it in their modified or updated one. And this, this would be, complaints just generally about a, a building personnel or, or employee of the district that are not that don't fall into the umbrella of the specific types of complaints that would be through the formal investigation process right right so this is where where I don't understand the process shall report any unresolved complaint mm -hmm at the next regularly scheduled board meeting. Are we informed when the complaint is initially made? I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of how this is worded and I think this is, this is a, a place where we could get some clarity on what, what the board wants and what the expectations are here because like I said, this is a holdover from KSB policy I don't really know what it means because to me, um, you'd want to know, the board would want to know if there's a um, potentially a, a complaint that, that would rise. You know, my, I guess you got to, to balance it out. So what if the complaint is, hey, I didn't like how my kid's homework assignment was graded. That's not the type of complaint that you really 
want to get to a board level, I don't think, at least initially. No, let's, let's put it in, in the context of I don't s support the choice of this book being used in this class. Yep. Now, I guess my question is, unless we have been informed by the parent, the teacher, the student, I'm not understanding, but then what I'm, I guess what I'm, I'm asking, and I, this is a question for Mr. Lopez, that I still contend we need to have a personnel committee because there's a lot of, of words here that if, if, <laughs> if Greg, who must litigate it, doesn't know how it plays out, then we're, 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 we're skating on thin ice, but that's, that's a decision for another day. But that's, that's my Mr. Lopez proposal to us to consider at a later meeting. And, and if you notice, if you notice here, and this, I mean, this is a good place for feedback on this because, you know, we can make changes to this to, to see what the board wants. But if you look at the way KSB has these, it's all about reporting unresolved complaints as opposed to advising about complaints. So if, it, if it's complaint about curriculum, now we'd have to go look and see what IF says, but it says the superintendent shall report a failure to resolve a complaint about curriculum to the board, which is kind of what you're talking about right now. Well, why are we not reporting when the complaint comes in? And if there is a resolution, it would be my question, I guess. Um, right. You don't know um, until you've got it to an unresolved spot. I assume that the unresolved spot would be the way this is worded or intended would then be for the board to try to step in to try to resolve it. You, you want things to go through the process. So in other words, if it's a complaint about curriculum, you want it to be reported down to your curriculum department for them to look into it, try to figure out a resolution, then come back. But as you suggest, it seems like this is a little late in the game for, for the notification well, of it. I'm just saying, you know, it here you at the beginning of this and other, it's the lowest level. Mm -hmm. Got that. We accept right. that. Resolve it. It it not that it never happened, but it 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 was resolved. Right. Now, that again is a judgment call. A parent or a student, you know, you did not resolve it to fit my needs. So it it I don't know. It just I I don't know what that says. That's what I'm guess I'm asking. So you know, approving it, psh, fine. We're proving words on a paper, and if it if it plays out, we're I, we're just hamstringed. The complaint yeah. process can be very complicated as well, um, and it's it's so you all gave a few different instances of complaints, and then you will have some that you don't consider to be necessarily resolved and they're really down in the weeds so i think the complaint process can be very complicated and that word can mean so many things yeah but well, i think i think that that's a place where there, there still needs to be some work or development or consideration exactly i would agree i i, I absolutely agree with that and i i like i said i i didn't touch it because it wasn't a change from what KSB had, had done in the past and what you guys have had in the past, but it is a place where I think it's worthy of discussion um, to what, how you guys want to handle these, these, these latter categories, right? And how are they documented? I mean, we talked about this just a little bit, but what platform are they documented in? So if we ever have to go back and revisit a complaint, we have a place that houses all of that information. So, I mean, you made a complaint in the office and who can validate that? No one, no one's gonna ever say that we, we heard that complaint or even addressed it or should we have? Well, I think, I think that, and I'm happy to try and play with those, but I, I really think those require some input from board. I, I don't think those are, those aren't like legal issues like the, the Title IX and the discrimination stuff, that a lot of that's really legally driven. Yeah. But this stuff here, this latter piece, other than the uh, emergency safety intervention stuff, that's legally driven. But these other things are not, you know, complaints about curriculum, complaints about facilities and services. Um, We're moving yeah. into processes at that point. Like, yeah. like and, and those, those aren't really, th those aren't like 
you have to do it this way or you to comply with the law, that kind of thing. These are, yeah. what do you, what do you, how do you guys want that to work? I mean, that's, that requires board input. Um, right. And, and almost, I mean, the case can be made, the facility services, it's, Mr. Lopez, can you scroll up a little bit? But saying that it's not safe would would lead to a legal situation. So uh, as I say, we need to spend more time on these words. And if I may, um, Greg, if I may ask a question maybe, because um, the way I'm reading it is, let's say we have a complaint about um, some place in, in the school that is not safe. And so we address it, we resolve it to the satisfaction of all parties. Um, what The way I'm reading it is then we would not need to report it to the board. It was brought to our attention and we resolved it. And we, if we not, not find a way, then we would, not, what's that? It's not required to be reported to the board in that situation. Right, because we resolved it. Um, and I'm thinking, um, not having been the author of, of this, I'm guessing um, it's it's done like that so that we do not report maybe a hundred complaints. Some may be very serious, some may be very um, easy to resolve, um, that we would only report the ones that were not resolved because those may end up in litigation, right? Yeah, or those may end up in front of the board at a board meeting for, for the board to weigh in and make a determination. Right. Which exactly. is really what would end up happening is that's one of the reasons the board doesn't address these issues at the front end sometimes because you want to let a chance to, for there to be a resolution. But at the end of the day, if somebody appeals up the decision, they don't like the they don't like the outcome that was decided by the the principal, and they don't like the outcome that the superintendent said. This is what we're going to do. They always are entitled to ask the board for to reconsider that, and then the board sits to make that final decision. Uh, I think that's what this is intended to be, is this, is this notion of if there is a resolution that's not reached satisfactorily, that the board is ultimately the decision maker on those complaints, but it's not worded that way. And so <laughs> I, 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 I think it is a place that some time should be spent on to make it what you guys want as a board for the district in those areas. So that's that's what I've got to report on KN for now. Um, I, I've got some notes written down and we'll obviously bring it back for a third read with, with suggested changes. But are there anything, any other concerns or questions about KN? And, and this KN is a big deal. So I, I do want to, I don't want to discourage anybody from not taking the time to ask questions. And even if you, even if you have them between now and the next time this is on the agenda, um, bring them up before there's a, a vote, final vote on it, so that we can make sure we address any concerns that you guys see in this. It's a big deal. Greg, where do we leave off? And I'm trying to figure out how to say this um, appropriately in this platform. Where do we leave off with reporting other complaints? We talked a little bit at some point about what complaint process should we have in place. And I know this is outside of legal just a little bit, but we, did we ever come up with anything? My memory does. My memory says no. We talked about it a little. So you mean complaints other than the the types that are referenced in the discrimination yeah. harassment? Yeah. yeah. So that that's a that's a good point. Um, I will tell you what Spring Hill did with this, and I could send this this language around um, for you guys to consider too. Spring Hill actually added some paragraphs to the beginning of this. KN policy that addressed other types of complaints and said, this is what happens with those. So if they don't fit into this neat category, this is what happens with them. Uh, I could send that around for you guys to take a look at and see if that's something you're interested in or not. Um, that would be helpful for me. I'm, right. I'm used to a place that governs. So I'm, I, I guess I'm looking for that place that governs and says this qualifies as a complaint in their, that escalation process. And I don't know that we necessarily have that. So I almost need to see an, another example yeah. of how the complaint process should be handled. What I will do is I will take that um, 
and Spring Hill adopted theirs for their last board meeting. So I will take the, the additional language that they added. I'll circulate that to the board, just send an email to everybody if that's all right. Um, and take a look at it and see if that's kind of along the lines of what you're thinking. And then we'll talk about it at the next board meeting. And if you want something like that added, then that's an easy add. Or if it's not, if I'm, if we're still missing the mark, then let's figure out some language that works for that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Clark, my comment would be, since we are a public entity, public school, anything is defined, you know, any, any, anything qualifies as a complaint. My concern is, and what I think the board concern is, is like, then what path does it fit in? Yeah. You know, now here's a complaint we think, you know, I didn't like the way you did X, Y, Z. Okay, then it, it fits over here. So, yeah. But but I don't think we are in the uh, position to say, no, that is not, that does not warrant a complaint. Excuse me, that does not warrant anybody's consideration and a response. Okay. So that, I mean, and that's that's such a large umbrella. It is. That it, it you know, if you don't like the temperature of the room, ha ha, because it could have other issues. Yeah, okay. You know, one of the things that, that I do in the training that, that we give from, I mean, when I say we now, I'm talking about our law firm. So one of the things we do in trainings where we talk about investigations of complaints and consideration, particularly for public entities and particularly for school districts, um, is we talk about what constitutes a complaint, which is what I think the one you're talking about. And that is anything that is brought to your attention as a school employee is a potential complaint. And you as the person who takes that in initially or should not be making that determination. And that's why it's so important. If I'm the janitor and somebody comes up and says something, I've got to report that on to an administrator who could at least have that discretion to decide, is this something that warrants an informal complaint or response? What is it that should happen at this point? Uh, but that everybody should be trained that whatever concern is brought to their attention should be treated as a complaint, at least for purposes of getting that reported to a, a supervisory employer and administrator to make that determination. So Nobody then you move into that. like tracking those and making sure that every one of them is respond responded to. Do you ever, I mean, when you think about the complaint process or is that something we have to think out? I think it's something you have to think out because it can't be, every single thing because then you then you get into the issue of um you know some things are not don't warrant a formal investigatory process they're just the day-to-day -day operations of the school building heck teachers get complaint from a student all the time that doesn't warrant an investigation or process but then they cross a line at some point when they do and that and, and figuring out where that is is tricky and that's just that's just training your employees to be able to correctly assess when that happens and, and when it's something that is more than what you're initially talking about but i can't tell you how many times we've been involved in your investigations or defending litigation or complaints or concerns where the biggest problem is when the kid or the parent initially tried to bring it to the attention of, of somebody at the school, they didn't understand that that's, they didn't recognize it as a complaint. And I'm not just talking about this school district, I'm talking about all the districts yeah. represent where they didn't understand that that's what, that, that was a serious issue. And it was only after somebody started investigating it that they figured out, oh my gosh, this is something that's really a big deal. Um, that's, it's recognition and, and you've got to have your, you got to have your people that are in those frontline positions trained regularly to identify those places where it might be a concern. It's no different than recognizing the symptoms of child abuse, for example. The kids don't come forward and say, hey, I'm X, Y, Z is happening to me. You've got to be able to identify what the kid's saying and say, is there something more here or not? Um, Sometimes there's not, it's not that big a deal. And other times it ends up being something and that's hard to navigate. Okay. Any other questions or concerns about KN before we move on to some of these other uh, policies that are probably a little more basic? Okay. If anybody comes up with any um, 
please don't be shy about it. Um, like I said, these are these are important ones. Okay. So Randy, I think that, I think now we're into the more. Oh, we need we need a motion. We need that motion. That. And again, we'll make further revisions and corrections and bring that back for a third read for the board. Would entertain a motion from anyone to accept the second read for that policy KN? So move. I think I can. Been seconded. Further discussion or questions? Thank you. That was a great conversation, everybody. Um, roll call vote, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. And Dr. Yeager. AC, yes, thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody, for that thoughtful conversation. So we'll go ahead and go on to policy CF. And I will pull that up. Let's just keep putting the red line version up, if that's all right. And sorry again to make you be the worker bee on this. I just don't think I've got access to do it. No, I don't mind. Okay, so this one is, this is solely KSB's recommended change. They're adding the word and and a comma or a couple commas. Uh, I, I don't see any problem with it, but this is KSB's recommended change. So um, we're bringing it forward as something for the board to consider adopting. I see a problem with limiting the um, approval of the board by saying the, in the next to the last sentence, it will normally proceed in those areas only after receiving the superintendent's recommendations. I have, I have a problem with only, the word only. So you would you would suggest taking the word only out? Correct. Okay. Could you explain why, please? Because I just I said to begin with, I think it limits the um, governing authority. While you know the board delegates, the first sentence is the, the is the directive delegating the superintendent administrative duties. But that last, by saying only after receiving the superintendent's recommendations, to me, limits the, the board's uh, governing authority. Actually, they contradict each other in a way, but, but I just think it limits it. Any other thoughts from other board members or questions? I actually would be in favor of, I mean, I see, I see exactly what Dr. Wynn is saying with the word only. And when you have normally proceed, so our normal process is, um, we have a normal process. If the board needed to step in for whatever reason, only would definitely stop us from being able to do that or even have an opinion. Um, so I could see, I could see the word only being a, a concern as well. I would agree with that also. I can go e I can go either way. I'm would still not comfortable the reason to remove it, but would you be comfortable with the words uh, adding in at best? after receiving the superintendent's recommendations. What, what, what did you say? At best? It will normally proceed in those areas at best after receiving the superintendent's recommendations. Yeah, I honestly, honestly, I don't know what at best would, how would it be defined? And it, it just, for, I think, I think being clearer is the best so the answer would be no 
Greg, do you have any opinion on this? Nope, I don't. I, I don't. I mean, I, I this is this is I'm presenting it as recommended by KSB. Uh, from a legal standpoint, my perspective is that the board has the ultimate decision making authority no matter what. So I don't think you're restricting yourself to follow the other um, because to me, even though it says nor will normally proceed, end of the day, the board can, can um, take action as it determines is appropriate for the district. So I understand the, um, you know, uh, the recommendation process that you're, you're you're trying to get a recommendation from the superintendent that's he's hired to run the school district you want to receive that recommendation before you act um and you know there certainly are, are some areas where you um delegate day-to-day -day operations to the superintendent where they're going to make you know uh, decisions um, in, in the course of the normal uh, process of the business but it, whether it says only or not, I don't think I don't think matters. I don't think it changes the policy. Okay, thanks. I make you want a motion, Mr. Lopez. Do you want a motion? Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Yeager. Were you speaking? I was just going to say. It, Based upon Greg's opinion, do you still feel strongly about removing only, or can it proceed as? I rec then then I'll answer it by I make a motion to delete the word only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Dr. Wynn, are you making the motion to accept the the second read with the modification of delete only? So are you moving to accept the the other modifications and removal of only? Correct, because the only difference is inserting the word and, which is in red. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that that was the motion. No problem. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Any other questions or thoughts? If not, or, oh. go ahead. Was someone speaking? Nope. I was just going to say, after hearing what after hearing what Greg said, I could really, like Jamie said, I could really go either way. I'm okay with with removing it or, or keeping it. So either way. It basically we're saying we will normally proceed in those areas after receiving the superintendent's recommendations. That's what it says. So or normally we will receive the superintendent's recommendations before we proceed. So yeah, that 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 sounds fine to me. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Um, Leslie, would you do a roll call vote for us, please? Okay. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Yeager. Stacey, yes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody. We will go on to policy DFE, and I will pull that up. Give me one second. Ed Craig. So this, this particular policy by KSB, frankly, was a mess. Um, this is the policy that tracks a statute that details how the district's um, monies are kept in financial institutions and there's specific statutory language that the KSB policy um, that currently exists as well as the proposed change language does not track. So I, what I ended up doing is I went back to the statute and the language that I've added back in, or the language I've added in and the, the, the changes that I've made uh, bring this policy back into compliance with this statute. Um, and, and I kind of give you some example, but the, the statute 
um, the way the policy was kind of written, it made it seem like that the, the district could um, deposit money. You, you've got sort of a tiered track. You have to uh, deposit monies um, based upon um, where the banking or financial institutions are located and available to do that. You know, how they respond to bids and things of that nature. Uh, with the first line of preference being given to those institutions that are within the district, the second line being within the county, then the state, and then, you know, beyond that. So um, that's the changes I've made. I'm happy to go over, over any of these individually, but basically that is what I did. I went back through the statute and I walked through to make sure the changes and language actually complies with the statutory language to make sure that you're kept in compliance legally with what you're supposed to do, as opposed to the language that had gotten into this policy, which did not comply with the statute. So in essence, does it give a, a not a preference, but to stop Mr. Mr. Lopez about about local banks uh, located within the district and the county or counties in which part of the district is located. Yeah, that with, yeah. It, there, there's some other requirements that, that condition that, but that is the gist of what the statute requires. Okay. Uh, and, and it's that statute, it's that, uh, oh, what is the statute? Let me make sure I got it right here. Um, I cut it at the bottom, I thought I did. Hold on a second. I don't know if I got the statute handy, but I will, I can send it so you guys can see what it says. But I, I basically, um, I think it might be that 12 1675, but I'll, I'll double check and make sure you guys get the statutory site so that you can verify it if you want. But that is what I did is I basically went through and made sure that the language was consistent with the statute as opposed to different from it. Any other questions for Craig? I make a motion that we approve the second read for policy DFE. I second it. Moved and seconded. Further questions or discussion? Mr. President, if I may add, um, this policy is really what we're already currently doing. Um, it just actually puts it into to board policy. The main change is that um, we would report investments to the board monthly, which we are not currently doing, and that would be really, really good information for us to share anyhow. Thank you, Tracy, for that clarification. Any other thoughts or questions? Ms. Kaiser, does it specifically say reporting monthly? That's the last sentence. Yeah, the very last sentence um, does say monthly, and we would be more than oh, I see. To provide that. Thank you. I see it. Great, thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? Been moved and seconded. Leslie, would you do a roll call vote? Thank you. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. And Dr. Yeager. Yes, yes, thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you, everybody. Um, so we will move on to policy GAAD, and I will pull that up. Greg, do you want to go ahead and start? Yep. Okay, so um, this one is a pretty massive change from your current policy. Um, 
partly because your current policy is simply a, a single sentence, uh, whereas KSB's current policy, you don't, you guys aren't following KSB's current recommended policy. So that's issue one. Uh, the second issue is that KSB's proposed policy, much like the one in DFE, does not track the statutory language. This policy is a big deal. Uh, because this is the policy that imposes mandatory reporting requirements on all employees of the district uh, if there's child abuse or suspected child abuse or neglect. Every employee of the district, to include the board members, are by statute and law the employee If you become aware of child abuse or neglect, you are required by statute to report that to DCF as well as law enforcement. And one of the things that I thought was important about this policy is I want to make sure if there's a, a concern about that, it's not only reported to these outside entities, but it's also reported internally to administration. So um, I rewrote, rewrote a lot of what KSB had to track the statute again. Um, this is part of the reason this is a big deal is, is if you have somebody who fails to report it, the district attorney can prosecute that individual for a misdemeanor. I wanna make sure the district's aware of those concerns if those are reported so that the district um, can take appropriate steps internally and also make sure that there is a, a correct reporting. Um, the district can make reports on behalf of uh, more than one staff member at a single time so the DCF doesn't get, you know, six reports as opposed to a single report submitted by six employees at the same time. Um, but the gist of it is that I'm tracking the statute and then you'll see at the tail end, we've added an annual training requirement, making sure that this is a, again, a place where your employees, all of your employees are trained every year on this piece as a requirement. And that's to ensure that we don't have anybody who can say, I didn't know I was supposed to report this. Um, because there have been problems, not again, not just with this district, but with other districts where we have had people who didn't report it. And that creates a problem both for, both for them individually and more importantly for the student involved. Any questions or thoughts for Greg? As Greg said, this is a pretty important one, so we want to make sure we're thoughtful. Go, go back up, Randy, and sure. Mr. Goheen, yep. where it says the reporting, stop please, uh, the interview, the inspection, the reports, are, are they codified? You know, are they clearly lined out so so the, the person knows what to do. Which, which, one, which one are you where he's at well, on the phone? Look at the last sentence. Any personal interview or physical inspection shall be conducted in appropriate manner. Okay, so you know you've got to have an adult witness present, but is there a, a formal um, a reporting form? Is there a interview form? Um, there, there is for there is for DCF. There's not for the um, school district. And the real issue there is there, there's no there's no like statutory requirement. But the, the way this would kind of unfold, let me give you some examples. Okay. The interview process might just be the, the district social worker or the counselor or the nurse or the building principal. Um, who receives a report of a con potential concern from a teacher, just calls the kid down and asks the kid a few questions and enough to look, to figure out whether there's reason to believe or suspect there's physical abuse or neglect. And at that point, you stop and you call DCF. The okay. physical inspection, you're really talking about the kid who comes to school and agrees or something like that. 
they get referred to the nurse, the nurse takes a look at them and then makes a determination. So that's what we're talking about here. It's not spelled out quite that cleanly because that would be a little bit case by case. Each situation would be a little bit differently or different in that respect. Um, but uh, you have to have, you don't want you don't want staff below a certain level doing those types of things. So that might be a place where, um, as I'm looking at it, we might want to clarify that sentence a little bit. Okay, but in addition to that, I mean, is there a reporting form that's consistent? You know, we have those incident forms that yeah. I interviewed Susie at 915, quickly observed scratches on her leg and signed off, sent her back to class or called parent. I mean, just to document that it was, that's, 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 we have that in our district, right? We do. Um, I will, I'll try and get a copy of that form so you guys can see what it looks like. Okay. I don't think, okay. I don't think it would have to be referenced. And then also just so you guys know, and um, I, my, my advice to your staff your, all your employees has been that when you guys report to DCF that you use the online form rather than the call-in number. Call-in number works. They take the information down, but you get documentation that you've submitted the, the information with if you use the online form, and the online form has more of that information that you're talking about right now. Okay. So it, it, it really is the better tool to report something. It is also something you can do 24 seven, whereas the phone call in, it's a hotline, but you're not getting to a live body during certain times of the day. So what does the policy say? Just report? The policy says report and use, it says or by phone or online. Oh, okay. But the guidance I have always given to not just this district, but the other districts and their employees is use the online form because it is a more thorough process and you can document better that you did it. Then you're going to change that language not to be either or, correct? Well, on your statement, based it, on your statement. It, it's it's either or because either or fits the statute. But my recommend, my strong recommendation is that they do online. So I could think, I could change it and say, um, should report uh, online or if. Because if you're not, if you, the, the reason you leave the phone number in is if I don't have access to the online computer, if I'm not where I can get online and do it, I at least need to pick up the phone and call somebody. Okay, but don't we provide, what kind of phones do we provide these individuals who would be in this capacity? iPhones? Oh, it's, it's, every, it's every employee in the district. Okay, yeah. so we all almost have phones that you can access the internet, correct? But okay, I get it. I get yeah, it. Whatever I, the language is yeah, to my, to get it done. Yeah, get, it's it's get it done, but if you have the option, they should do the online. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, any other questions for Greg? Because I'm, I'm just scrolling down just so we all, hopefully we had a chance to look at it. If not, would entertain a motion to accept this for the second read. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. Further questions or thoughts? Okay. Leslie, please do a roll call. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. And Dr. Yeager. Tracy, yes, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to policy HAE. So HAE is this deals with negotiations and designating um, representatives to do negotiations. This is a uh, policy recommendation changed by KASB. Uh, they're changing the word agents to representatives. 
I do not know why, but I don't think it makes any difference. So I, to be consistent with their policies, I'm recommending that you go along with it, but that's, that's the change. I, I don't know what the difference between the word agent and representative is. The Russians. Uh, yeah, I sometimes sometimes policy sometimes policy will change the language. Um, somebody decides the language looks better as representatives. I know that another negotiation statute talks about representatives. It talks about agents too, but I don't. The statute uses the two terms interchangeably, so I don't see a difference. But to keep your policies consistent with KSBs, I. I see no reason to not make the change. I move to approve HAE. Second. And seconded. Any further questions? Roll call, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. And Dr. Yeager. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Motion, pa motion passes. Thank you, everybody. So moving on to policy IC. Get it up there. So here's the difference with this one. Uh, your current board policy does not include the, the first two paragraphs of the current KASB model policy. So those, those are the two things that are in red that got that got added there. Um, you'll see on the third line, there is a capital, there's a sentence that ends with the period after year and then starts the next sentence with the word and. Uh, I can't stand things that start with the word and, so I struck it, but that's a, that's a personal preference of mine. If you don't want, if you don't care, then you can leave the word and in. That's how KSB did it. The other modification KSB made was to the, uh, where is it, let's see. They changed, um, KSB made the suggestion to change the word shall to may. I left it as shall, but if you want it to be may, to be consistent with their policy, that's fine. I make a motion that we approve um, IC for the second read. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further questions or discussion? Thank you. Roll call, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Yeager. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everyone. Going on to policy IJ. Pulling it up. So this is another one where uh, KSB has changed the word um, shall to may. I left it in as, as recommended by KSB. I don't see any legal issue with it being either shall or may, and it's really the board's discretion as to how you want it to read. Mm. I'm thinking that this probably should be shall because if you are concerned with improvement, why wouldn't you use the evaluation that you just conducted? Good question. I agree. And if you were not going to use it, why would you conduct it? <laughs> it's a waste of resources. So I'm fine with shall too. Yeah. Right. And say why they changed it to May. I mean, there was no reason behind that. 
they, they had some language in about let, leaving it to making it more discretionary. I, I, I don't understand the change, to be honest with you guys. I just put it out there because it was a recommended change and um, there's no legal prohibition to making the change. So I, I bring it to the board to make a decision. Um, but I, whether you leave it as shall or make it may, that I think that's just totally discretionary with the board, how the board wants this policy to read. Um, but All right, Sal. Well, do we make, need to make a motion or we just accept? Well, my, my suggestion is, is that if you, if everybody wants to leave it as shall, um, I would, I would make the motion to, to leave it as shall. Uh, I, okay. There's, so no reason, there's no reason to bring it back. I mean, you're not making a change to the policy. So I make it the motion to have the word read as shall. Second. Yeah. Second. Did any other questions or thoughts? I mean, I can go either way. I don't have a preference. The only instance in which I thought the word may may help is if you can, let's say you conduct an evaluation and for some reason do not get enough data back or in that, let's say part of the evaluation is um, a survey and then you don't get enough participation to make that evaluation valid. If it says shall, then you still have to use it. If it says may, it gives you a little bit more freedom to say, well, we may not, we may decide not to use this particular evaluation because it did not have enough participation. I mean, that's just an example. <laughs> yeah, and then on the other hand, even if it had limited participation, if the uh, suggestions hmm. were significant, I mean, it shall the evaluation shall be part of it. You you can still discount it. That doesn't rule out trashing it. You know, I mean, honestly, but but it. Uh -huh. it, it my concern is that you, like you said to begin with, you take time and you develop guidelines that come from, what does it say, uh, committees that you've, you've created and then you don't do anything with it? That doesn't make sense. It but might but yet I, I agree with what you're saying, um, Dr. Miguel, because Shell does put a different emphasis because May say it, could, it may or may not be included. Just like it says, you know, on that second line in the second paragraph, the superintendent may require the report, reports from the committee, which may be included. So therefore it does give you more, um, more, uh, more of an option as to what should be included and what shouldn't be included. So I, I understand that perspective. I mean, for what for what it's worth, I think that the the way I read this, the only difference is is that if you develop guidelines or if you develop a committee report, that you're going to consider it as part of whatever your plan is. It doesn't mean that you're going to adopt it. So, I, I in the context that it's written, I don't think it makes any difference, which is why I didn't really give an advice one way or the other in it. So, you know. So if they do evaluate an instructional program and decide not to use it, it wouldn't be held against them if, if um, they didn't decide to use it because that's been done before. Things have been held against um, some administration that wasn't clear. So we just want to make sure that nothing is taken out of context. They held against them, what are you saying? Well, sometimes, you know, um, if things weren't interpreted appropriately, held against meaning that they were um, told that they weren't appropriate or that they didn't do it right intentionally rather than unintentionally. So I just don't want to mix words to where later on they get they, uh, it's, it's accusations of, well, this evaluation was done and you chose not to use it 
in our policy IG said that you should use it. I don't want us to have to be able to mix words. I think that last sentence in the second paragraph, and I hear what, what everyone's saying, but maybe that gives us the leeway because the superintendent may submit a comprehensive report um, from the committee to the board. So they're taking all of the information, um, if I'm reading it right, they take all the information that's gathered and then it's up to the superintendent and they could or could, may or may not include some of that um, from the, the committee. So that gives a little leeway there too. Um, to do some of what Dr. Yeager or Dr. Miguel had mentioned as well, maybe. I read it where they have to, that they will submit the information to us, but we can decide whether we want to use it or not. So if the information's there, they give it to us. And then if we don't want to use it, then we just discard it. But maybe I'm reading it too simply. Well, it's, yeah. Any other thoughts? So it's been uh, moved and second <laughs> go back to shall, uh, to keep the languages shall. Um, there's been some discussion on both sides. So we'll just go ahead and vote and kind of see where, where things land. So Leslie, would you? Oh, please. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Stacy, uh, Dr. Yeager. Stacy, no. Thank you. All righty, thank you. The motion passes. Um, so we will move on. Thank you for the discussion, everyone. Policy JQKA. I'm pulling that up. Give me one second. Yep. So this is this is the policy on foreign exchange students, which will clearly have no impact this year since there won't be any foreign exchange students. Um, these are just again pure recommendations from KSB on changing the policy, uh, changes the shall to may, um, limits the, um, or puts a, puts a requirement to the extent staff and facilities are available to when they're admitted, because um, they're admitted on a tuition-free basis of their foreign exchange student, and adds the word Kansas in front of State Department. Uh, I see no issues, issues from a legal standpoint Clearly there aren't gonna be any this year, so it would not even be something that's gonna impact anybody until next year, but you know, I, I don't really have any um, information beyond the fact that that's what they're changing. I make a motion that we approve JQKA for a second read. Been moved, is there a second? Second, I was trying to find my unmute. <laughs> All right, moved and seconded. Any further questions, discussion? Matt, Leslie, please call the vote. Thank you. Okay, Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Jamie Humphreys. Jamie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Yeager. Thanks, yes, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we will now go on to policy K and A. Okay, not to be confused with KN, which was one of our big ones earlier. This policy deals solely with complaints about the nutritional service program. This is a requirement of a new requirement for your food service program by federal statute. Um, KSB's proposed policy is uh, in the black typeface. The red are changes that I have made to the policy to make it consistent with our other non-discriminatory language. So for example, KSB's policy did not include the word ethnicity, did not include religion, did not include um, 
gender orientation, identity, or expression, didn't include gender information or any other basis prohibited by law. I've added those in because I think it's important that it's consistent with our, our other non-discriminate discrimination policies. Same reason I added Title IX down after Title VI. Um, and then I included a section uh, in red where uh, complaints about the, the policy is written didn't have a place to complain to somebody within the school district about nutritional program concerns. The only thing it had was a complaint to the Department of um, Agriculture with the with federal government. So I added a line for us to include our district compliance coordinator, which is our director of nutritional services. The blank is because I didn't know what the contact information was. We need to include that. But those are the changes that I've recommended to the, the draft policy that KASB provided for us on this. And this is a new policy required because of a change in the federal law. I'll make a motion that we approve the second read of KNA. I second it. Moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? So Greg, the only place you can get the complaint form is USDA? That's the way uh, that's the way it was drafted by KASB. Uh, I I added that they could complain. Okay. First, so that that because to me, if there's a complaint about our food services program, we'd like to know what it is. So, uh, do we have our own complaint form? We would need to develop one. Okay. Put that on the to-do list. Yep. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. Leslie, would you please do the roll call, please? Okay. Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Janie Humphreys. Janie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Wanda Brownlee Page. Wanda Brownlee Page, yes. Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn, yes. Dr. Necker. Pace, yes, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so now we are on to the policies for tobacco, tobacco use, um, JAOC, JCDAA, and KMA. Greg, do you want me to pull them up one by one? Yeah, I guess we should do it one by one, and, and we can kind of maybe run through them real quick, and then uh, you guys can make the motion all as one, or you can do them one at a time, whatever you prefer. Um, you'll recall when we had the, the initial first read, I posed the question, and, and you'll see in, in the agenda and board docs, we have our current versions. We have one for students and one for personnel. Um, ours don't match KSB's current policies. Um, and we don't have one for uh, people outside of the district, non-employees, visitors, prohibiting them from using tobacco products. So um, when we talked with the board last time, the board said, let's do the more robust policies that KSB has done. So that is what the modifications look like, the cross outs of our current policy and plugged in uh, KSB's uh, changes to the policy that they're recommending um, and essentially uh, with respect to each of those categories uh, the possession use or promotion of tobacco products is going to be prohibited by staff in this policy the, the g policies are always personnel um, so if you go down randy to where it starts off the word use that will be the first sentence in the policy once the change is made so it will say the use, possession, or promotion of any tobacco products by staff members is prohibited at all times in any district facility, school vehicles, school sponsored activities, programs, or events, or on school owned uh, or operated. And then it's got some definition of what constitutes a tobacco product, electronic delivery product, which is like a, you know, one of the um, electronic cigarettes or whatever. It defines what promotion is, meaning advertising, which means a kid or a staff member can't wear a, a school tobacco t-shirt to school. Um, so that's that's what it is now. There's a carve out just for FDA approved um, nicotine replacement therapies. Basically, if you've got nicotine gum, lozenges, or the patch, 
um, is yeah. Greg, we can't hear you. There's something going on with your microphone. No, we can't hear you. No, no, we still cannot hear you. How about now? Any better? Yes, I hear that. Sorry about that. I don't know where I cut off, but what I was saying was that uh, excluded from the policy, obviously somebody can wear like a nicotine patch or nicotine gun if they're trying to quit smoking or quit using products. That's excluded. Um, but otherwise, this would ban uh, tobacco products or advertising by a staff member on school property or school events. And I think the last time it was Dr. Wynn and who stated that we need to post it. We've never, as far as I, I can recall, I don't remember ever seeing it posted anywhere. So we need to post that as well. I agree. So Greg, if I, I'm pretty sure this is pretty cut and dry. I just want to make sure we're saying it aloud. We have a teacher that smokes cigarettes. We're saying this teacher would need to leave their cigarettes in their at home. Because when I read this, that's exactly what I'm thinking. When they're parking a school school property, right? Right. How does that work for smoke breaks? I'm asking questions that other people probably will ask. What is that we don't they don't get smoke breaks. Okay. Okay. They're not, not allowed to have, I mean, they're just not allowed to have tobacco products on school property, so they can't step out and, you know, smoke in the parking lot or they just, it's just not permitted. And I've seen other companies where it's like off property, so we're saying not at all. And I just want to make sure I'm completely clear. Okay. To clarify, this is in the, right? this is in the policy. Uh, we've, we've had a policy, it's not quite as, the, the crossed out thing at the top that says option one, that's our policy, that's our current policy, I believe. Or it might be shorter than that. Randy, you want to pull up our current policy real quick so the board can see it? And I think also we had discussion last time, or or sometime about getting signs to post it appropriately so yeah. visitors and things can know when they come on the property no we last time it was brought up that we don't have a current um current signage for this and if that's i mean if we're going to have these policies we probably ought to have some signage so you can see what our current policy says it's one sentence So does that mean we are a tobacco-free campus? Uh, we would be. With the, if these three policies are adopted, we are tobacco-free on all our facilities. So that could be a sign on the outside. Yep. Do you need signs on the inside? I, I, to me, I think you just need them on the outside so people coming into the buildings know they can't have tobacco products in the building. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't remember if you outside. told us, can students smoke? Nope, they cannot. That's the next call. You might want to put it in the inside too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it's in the student handbook, but I'm not certain of that. But yeah, I understand. And that includes, you know, chewing tobacco. So you can't have these coaches out there chewing tobacco to practice. Mm -hmm. um, So um, that's the recommendation to go with KSB's policy for this. Um, if Randy, you want to pull up the student one next? That'd be the J one. Yeah. 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 Can y'all see it now? Mm -hmm. So it basically reads the same way as it mirrors the one for staff. 
Um, and it's, I went with the more robust one, which is at the bottom. Um, student violations will re result in disciplinary actions, um, which may be start off with just notifying the parents initially to, to sort of um, further discipline if there's, if there's further issues. So this policy does not speak to our students that are maybe under the influence already prior to coming to school. It does not. Um, that would have to be drugs, right? This yes, is yes. only tobacco or if they're vaping, that sort of thing. This is, this is directed at tobacco. That's true. You're right. I'm thinking of drug usage. Yeah. You are. But that's okay. It's, it's, that's a, I mean, it's worth pointing out. Um, this doesn't mean a kid can't smoke a cigarette, walk into school, and then come to school having just smoked a cigarette because we can't do anything about that. This is just on school property or at school events or school activities or in the buildings. Well, then I think you also have to think, I mean, yes, we're talking about tobacco and um, tobacco could be used a lot of different ways. So. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's the one for students. And then Randy, you want to pull up the one for um, visitors? And this one is new. We do not have one for visitors currently. Uh, but it would mirror the one for students and for staff members. Again, this would mean that if parents show up, um, they're not to bring tobacco products on school property um, or games or, um, you know, they can't go out in the middle of the basketball game, go out in the parking lot, smoke a cigarette and come back in. So just understand what we're adopting. Again, do we need to say the proper signage in and out? Yeah, no, I, there, yeah. I, there, you're going to want to put signage up on your, that, that says this, just like you, you know, like we have the guns free. Um, uh, yeah. And you know, we have a group of students, I think they were at Slagle that um, lobbied for reduction of selling of tobacco products in, in our neighborhoods. So that group could be used as, for lack of a better word, ambassadors mm -hmm. to um, deliver the message, encourage students, uh, not so much encourage students, but um, their peers, you know, talk, peers talking to peers about t tobacco usage. And so it already exists. They come visit me when I come to, I mean, up in Topeka. And I know a few of them, the core are at Slago, but I think even this, the nurse came with them. I can't remember exactly, but there's all, already a coalition of, of um, for lack of a better word, anti-tobacco usage or expansion of tobacco usage because nicotine is, it's a tough habit for those who smoke, so they tell me. Yep. And it's a good message to be getting out your social workers and everybody else, you know. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions for Greg or any further discussion? Not. I think those are the only ones, right, for this one? Yeah, that, that's it for the policies that we have um, suggested changes to that are, are presented to the board for a second read at this time. Um, like I said, the, you know, you, any of these policies, if you guys have additional changes or thoughts or questions about them between now and the final read and vote, obviously bring them forward and the board should understand this, even once the policy is adopted, you can always bring back a question about a change or a modification to it. So 
Um, they are the board's policies to be adopted. It's important to have them in place, but it's important for them to be what you guys want. And so we can take as much time with any of them as you want to do. I make a motion that we approve the second read of GAOC, JCDAA, and KMA. Second. Moved and seconded. Further questions, discussion? I would just, um, to the point of uh, that other board members have made, just if, I don't know who it would be, um, if you could report back to the board once we do get those that signage up um, and where that signage is, I think that's going to be something that we've talked about a couple of times, so and, and it's going to be. Also to, and also to notify our contractors that are um, here building and things on school grounds um, so they clearly know the new policy. Well, anybody, because I think they said any person who's coming to the yeah. building, that was I, spelled out. I'm sure our facilities management team will do that, that they're really good about doing stuff like that. And our risk management team will make sure all that's done, I'm sure. And actually, it may help reduce the cost of insurance premiums for those. Essentially, it could be framed as a tobacco cessation program or effort. I think your I think your health insurance plan. Somebody probably correct already it. has it. I think it's got a cessation program that is available mm -hmm. to staff members. And this would be a way to encourage them to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, vendors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, everybody. So um, there's no further discussion. Leslie, would you please do a roll call vote? Yolanda Clark. Yolanda Clark, yes. Maxine Drew. Maxine Drew, yes. Jamie Humphreys. Jamie Humphreys, yes. Randy Lopez. Randy Lopez, yes. Dr. Wanda Brownlee Page. <laughs> I'm Dr. <laughs> Page, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Wynn, <Wynia>. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, and Dr. Yeager. Dr. Yeager, yes, thanks. Thank you. Motion passes, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Before we adjourn, just, uh, yes, I wanna say thank you, Leslie, for um, working with us today. You did an amazing job, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you to everyone watching, all board members and staff. Um, again, just want to wish everyone a, a, a good three-day weekend. Be safe. Everyone that's watching, please wear your masks. That's a sign of love for each other. Um, so please, please, please be safe on this holiday weekend. And uh, let's be excited because we have our remote learning that starts next week on Tuesday. So that's a great day for, for us, for our kids. So let's keep that in mind as well. Um, and we have our regular board meeting next Tuesday at 5 p.m. So with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Woo! Thanks. <laughs>